Black Lives Matter came into being because of a deep longing for a multiracial democracy that works for all of us. That is, in essence, what this project has been about. Um, myself and the other two co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Patrice and Alicia, are, were organizers, people who were committed to organizing for social justice and human rights in our respective contexts. So me coming from Arizona, the, the two of them coming from California. Um, I work across the country and working specifically with black immigrants and African Americans. And for, for us who were committed to doing the very day in and day out work of organizing, we were struck that even in the 21st century, even with, um, you know, a black president, that there was a woeful silence around anti-black racism in our society. That there was a woeful disconnect between our communities when it came to issues of racial inequality and injustice. And so you and I and many of us know all the statistics about high poverty rates, um, the disparities in the healthcare system. We, we know all this information, right? We have the data, we have the, um, we have the stories. However, we were also really struck with the fact that we needed a movement, right? We needed a movement, a, an uprising of people to elevate our consciousness, level of our awareness, and do something about the disparities that we've been experiencing for generations upon generations. And so Black Lives Matter really emerges from a long, long history of black liberation struggle. Ever since we were kidnapped from Africa, enslaved, brought here to live and work on stolen land, right? Stolen land and the indigenous genocide was what preceded that, right? Allowed that to be. And we're very painfully aware of that history. Um, and with that knowing and with that coursing through our own veins, we felt the unction to, to do something about it, to rise up. And, you know, you named Trayvon Martin, and that was really, for us, the, the moment where we said, you know what, enough is enough. This silence has got to end, right? Um, and we're gonna utilize some of the social media, new media tools in order to organize and amplify our voices. Um, but this is something that we already knew instinctively, right? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the story, right? So many of us probably even remember where we were when we heard that George Zimmerman was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. I mean, raise your hand if you... So like everybody, right? It was such a pivotal moment in our history and in our collective consciousness. Um, and I remember exactly where I was. I had just watched uh, the film Fruitvale Station, right? The story of Oscar Grant, unarmed black man murdered by Oakland Police Department um, on New Year's Day. And I had just watched that film. I walked out and I was, you know, you go to your cell phone because you're looking for a little, you know, numbing or something, right? You did. And I remember going, looking through my cell phone and getting a number of texts and tweets that notified me that George Zimmerman was being acquitted of Trayvon Martin's murder. And it hurt, right? It hurt. I think so many of us were, were stunned. Some of us were a bit cynical, you know, some of us who've been doing this type of work for a long time and concerned of, with issues of social justice, um, knowing that oftentimes the justice system will never or rarely render a verdict in favor of black lives. Um, doesn't, it just has a hard time seeing our, our lives as valuable or knowing that we have pain and, and reconciling that. And so for many of us, we were, we were stuck with both the rage, we were stuck with the pain, and I got the tweets, I got the text messages, and I knew I needed to be in action. 
I saw a social me media message from my sister, Alicia Garza, that in essence read on Facebook, black people, I love us, our lives matter, black lives matter. And for me, that was it. It was, it was simple, it was a love note. And I had a background in communications and doing some social media, um, using social media for organizing. And so I reached out to her and said, I think this actually captures it. This Black Lives Matter thing captures it. And it's a, it's a phrase um, and it's a calling that is both a demand as well as a critique. Um, and so we decided to set into motion a little bit of a project. You know, first it was a political platform of sorts and a rallying cry and we're connecting with people across the country. And then about a year later, sadly, Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson, Missouri. And many of us know that story very, very well. And many of us also watched on social media as the story began to unfold, you know, young unarmed black man murdered by a police officer, his body languishing in the streets for over four hours as the entire neighborhood watched on. It was traumatizing. It was. And we saw a community also outraged that they would have to witness it, that children would have to bear witness to this, and that it was going to be status quo. We're gonna move on from that point. And they, in essence, had the most courageous uprising in modern history and called on us as people to respond to the injustice that they, they were experiencing. And so with the Black Lives Matter platform, we were able to reach out with the help of Darnell Moore, who's a brilliant activist, Patrice, Monica Dennis, a number of different people, and in less than two weeks, organized the first ever Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride to Ferguson. 500 black people showed up, on, you know, just kind of knowing that this was the destination and we're using new media tools to, to coordinate our efforts, and it was, it was profound. And I think it was at that moment where we shifted from, you know, the language, the rhetoric, the, the sharing and the awareness to the embodiment of our values, right? We were gonna show up in a way to ensure that black lives actually matter. Um, and that's a little bit about, you know, Black Lives Matter. And it was significant then and it's significant now because there's this whole kind of myth that we were living in a post-racial society, right? We have, you know, we have a black president, we have Oprah Winfrey, you know, <laughs> we have some exceptional folk, but really that, that notion of exceptionalism just serves to reinforce the status quo. And the reality is that large amounts of black people are living in poverty, faced with high unemployment rates, faced with substandard education systems in our communities, you know, displaced and disinvested communities. Um, and that was the reality. And we, we were saying, you know, enough is enough. And this is not just about police brutality, but this is about structural racism and the way in which racism shows up in every sphere of our society.